One of the things that I find about just the, the, all of the energy issues in general is that people, all of us, really tend to take energy for granted and, and we don't have any idea how much we really use and how much we depend on it. And right now in the United States, uh, power consumption in the U.S. is about four terawatts. And uh, of that, about three and a half, roughly 3.4 terawatts, is uh, provided by fossil fuels. And if we wanted to replace that by building nuclear reactors, for example, we would need to have a gig one gigabyte, which is a very large nuclear reactor, located on every 10 miles of major waterway and coastline. That's 3,400. Uh, one gigabyte nuclear reactors we would need for that 3.4 terawatts of power. And those are huge numbers and, and it's just hard for people to get their heads around them. And so, you know, we really came to the conclusion that whatever you do needs to be solar based in order to be safe and plentiful enough and that sort of thing. Well, probably about 10 or 11 years ago, uh, I was at Yale University and uh, I was thinking about big issues that, that we really need to deal with and uh, energy was, was the one that seemed the, the biggest to me and, and the most problematic. And uh, about that time I found that uh, certain species of algae and, and, uh, bac and bacteria, cyanobacteria, were able to use solar energy to split water and make hydrogen. The process of making hydrogen that these organisms employ uh, is, um, is pretty mysterious. There's really a lot that, that remains to be learned about that. Uh, the enzymes, as far as we know, the enzymes that make most of the hydrogen, if not all, are called hydrogenase enzymes. And those enzymes tend to be very sensitive to oxygen. So when these organisms are photosynthesizing, and producing oxygen, then those hydrogenase enzymes that make the hydrogen tend to shut down. And so the result is that uh, at least the conventional wisdom has been that they make hydrogen only in relatively small amounts and only at sort of restricted periods, generally at night or in the dark, um, or sometimes when they are moved from dark to light, there will be a burst of hydrogen production for a sh very short period of time. So we've been looking for about five years now into how can we do something to make these organisms make more hydrogen and to make it uh, over longer time periods, you know, and especially in the light. If we could get them to do it in the light, that would be very nice. We study hydrogen production from cyanobacteria uh, that are uh, their photosynthetic bacteria basically, um, commonly called blue-green algae. Um, we're looking at um, hydrogen production from photosynthesis, so it's a way to produce hydrogen from sunlight and water. And uh, we're hoping that this will provide some insight into a renewable and sustainable way of producing hydrogen so that it may be used for a renewable fuel uh, to produce electricity and heat and power from fuel cells. And another thing that we're doing in some research funded by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research is to look at how we can turn these systems into a panel type configuration so that it could be like a, like a photovoltaic panel, for example. And um, so we hit upon the idea of embedding them in a material called sol gel, which is kind of like a glass sponge and uh, it's made from the same materials that glass is made from, basically sand. My research is specifically focused on uh, two different ways to manipulate uh, the cells in their environment to try to increase hydrogen production. Uh, the first, uh, the environmental manipulation, is uh, an encapsulation technology to put them inside of a solid matrix. Um, it's silica gel, it's basically porous glass but uh, it comes from liquid precursors as opposed to a uh, hot liquid melt that um, you, know, you would use to make windows or something like that. But the, the density is much lower, it's very porous. Uh, it's like a glass sponge. And the idea is that uh, we can put them inside the solid matrix that's stable 
and by constricting their growth or inhibiting their ability to do what they want to do, which is grow and divide, uh, they're left little alternative but to direct some of their energy towards production of other things, secondary metabolites, um, and hydrogen in particular is the one we're after. Uh, and I've had um, some good luck seeing increased hydrogen production from encapsulated cells. One of the interesting things about that is that if you could put them in a format like this, you know, they're encased so they're not you know, they're not going to get into the environment, the environment is not going to get into them, so they're not going to get contaminated. The idea is that um, rather than having a liquid culture that needs to be constantly stirred and moved around with pumps um, and involves a lot of tubing and canisters and things like that, um, another advantage of this solid gel is that you can basically put them into a solid film. Uh, it creates basically a solar panel. Uh, or in concept, it's sort of a, a format like a solar panel that you could put something at an angle in a solid, a solid form, so that it can then, you know, absorb sunlight uh, and produce some hydrogen. Um, and even better, these guys don't need really bright direct sunlight like a solar panel does. They don't have to be in direct sunlight to function. So you could take these panels and put them on the north sides of buildings, for example, hang them vertically or horizontally or any position, essentially, and they could still function and make hydrogen. We decided that we really wanted to try to go to something that would be more like what some people have called the milk cow approach. What we want to do is to try to use them kind of like milk cows. We don't want to slaughter the cow, we want to get the milk. And in this case, the milk is the hydrogen. What I'm looking at is I'm trying to redirect energy flows within the cell. Um, Synecocystis, as Roger talked about, uh, redirect energy flows toward hydrogen production. What I'm doing right now is testing three different promoter sequences to see which of them I will ultimately use for gene expression. And I'm doing that by using these sequences to express a fluorescent protein, in this case a, a protein that fluoresces yellow. And so I'm assembling DNA sequences at this point, and I'm ex assembling them in uh, small circular sections of DNA called plasmids that can replicate in bacteria. So what I'm doing right here is I've used enzymes called restriction enzymes that cut DNA at specific sequences and uh, so I know that if the plasmid contains the sequence that I expect it will cut into specified lengths and then I'm using uh, a gel made of agarose which separates DNA by length that's uh, apply an electric field across the gel and uh, the shorter fragments move much faster than longer fragments and so by also running a series of known DNA markers, I can determine what size these DNA fragments are. And uh, in this particular gel, I'm seeing all the fragments that I expected to see, which means that uh, the constructs are all, have all been created successfully in this case. This parking garage and office building were rated as one of the top 10 uh, greenest buildings in the world by Forbes. ZGF Architects designed uh, the building. We worked for about two years in schematic, conceptual and schematic design, and then um, final design was a period of about six months and threw out, out construction, which took two and a half years. We basically wanted to bring um, the downtown workforce in and work with the aviation workforce in, under one roof. So we had a, a one port sustainability initiative. Um, we factored in several different sustainability features into the parking garage um, and the headquarters. We have an eco roof. We have a living machine. We have daylight harvesting. We have a geothermal uh, and radiant panel heating and cooling system. We've only been in about six months, but we're seeing between 30 and 50% energy savings as compared to a typical office building. The Living Machine is a biological wastewater treatment system. Um, we use it to capture and recycle all of the wastewater generated by the headquarters building. So um, toilet flushing, sinks, we have a shower facility on site. Um, that all gets collected into a primary tank and the liquid gets pumped into the living machine system and so that's a series of 10 different um, cells that fill up and drain about every 45 minutes and the media inside the cells um, has bacteria growing on it. It's a 
microbial agent that basically acts to essentially eat the bad bacteria. So it, it captures the wastewater bacteria and treats it such that it's basically cleaned as it gets through the entire system. It acts like a tidal system out in the ocean. So as it fills up and drains, it treats everything and then as that's cleaned, it gets pumped into our effluent um, tank after it gets treated with a little bit of chlorine and a little bit of ultraviolet um, treatment. We have the chlorine and the UV as kind of a backup system, but it goes through enough cycles throughout the day that it, it's very clean when it gets to the end. The living machine system treats and allows us to conserve about 80% of the building's water use. So typical office space, the size that we have, um, just think of, I think there's about 900,000 gallons used a year. We reuse 80% of, of that water. We have a, an extensive and an intensive eco-roof. Um, we have one eco-roof on the 10th floor, which is about 10,000 square feet. We received a grant through the City of Portland eco-roof grant. It is a combination of seven different types of sedum. It came in a two by two tray, basically that was palleted and conveyored up into place. It was very quick and easy um, to do. And the vegetation was pre-grown, so it came well established. It didn't allow for a lot of uh, weeds to mix in there with the different um, sedums. So it's been easy to maintain um, throughout the process and we're pretty happy with it. It flowers in the spring and goes dormant in the summer. It does filter, so it, it absorbs a significant amount of rainwater and slows down the stormwater runoff from the roof. It also acts um, as an insulator to the roof because there is office space below it. We have two atriums up in the office that act to drive light down into the office space. Um, on the south side, we also have um, photocell controlled uh, blinds that adjust periodically throughout the day and they're concave, so they actually bounce light further into the space. So it, it actually provides a lot of natural light for the people working in the office. We've had a lot of different developers come through and look at the building and everyone's been really impressed with how we've been able to capture a lot of daylight and get a lot of uh, natural materials into the building and at the same time conserve energy. It's very comfortable in the space. Um, there's not a lot of um, heating and cooling issues. So it's been definitely something we're very proud of.